Hey kids, this is Ivan. How you doing? Happy New Year. It is January 1st, 2018. And can you believe it? I have a video topic already. So, a lot of times in this channel I will say, Hey, I was thinking about something the other day. But every once in a while something will happen that really gets me thinking about something. And this is one of those times. So I wanted to talk about this subject and attack it from a few different angles. and From a, um, the perspective of a few different games. So I wanna, I'm going to start talking about one game, but hang on because it's going to go to more of, you know, uh, it's going to go from a few different directions. Um, now, I'm involved in this group where we're playing this game called The Veil. You may have watched an episode of that or two of that. And we were talking the other day about how we might want to handle a couple things differently. Some things that came up in, in the game where, you know, maybe we want to do this, you know, we realize maybe we do this just a little bit wrong. Or we, we can, maybe, well, it's more like we can improve how we're doing this. And, you know, I realized this had a lot to do with, you know, um, what I've been reading about in Fantasy Flight Star Wars and the Genesis system. And I realized that had a lot to do with some, some other games. So I want to talk about this idea of, you know, structured um, gameplay versus narrative gameplay. Um, and, you know, how, how we create the fiction. How part of it's being created by the rules, by the system. How part of it's being created by how we narrate. You know, Samuel G was talking about the idea that the, there is this dualism. And there is this, uh, you know, objective, uh, normative experience, you know, fall, created by the rules. This set of rules, you know, suggest experience X. You change a rule, you're now going to get experience Y. Uh, coupling that with the, uh, the more subjective or perceptive uh, aspect, where now we're, we're, we're agreeing to narrate things in a certain way to produce this feel. And it's less su supported by the rules, and it's more supported by, like, we know the genre we're trying to go for, we know the feeling we're trying to go for, we have these concepts, and now you know we've agreed to narrate in line with those concepts. If you get what I'm saying. So here's what happened in the game and uh, in the veil that we were talking about. And keep in mind, before I start talking about this, I am not throwing same old G under the bus. None of us are. Uh, there was a moment where same old G, as the MC, as a GM, um, had a GM move. He did something, and we were just talking about how like we might have handled that a little bit differently in the fiction. So here's what happens. My character Tess. Rune Singer's character is Cadmus. We're going from point A to point B in this really busy, you know, gi you know, uh, giant uh, megapolis. It's, it's cyberpunk, you know. So just picture all that, the, the bodies everywhere. And there's this point where Cadmus, his character, he's playing a character which is using the playbook of the dying. And one of the things of the dying, you know, one of the hallmarks of the dying, is that they're really good at detecting patterns. And so he is attempting to detect patterns in the crowds. There are these specific questions he was asking. And so he rolls a dice. This is a move. And he fails. He rolls a miss, you know, six or less. So at this point, what that triggers is a Game Master move. And there's a whole list of Game Master moves in the book. And there's, there's a summary page of what they are. There's a, a GM uh, cheat sheet, which I believe Samuel G was using. Because it's, you know, when you have all the moves or all the playbooks and everything else, you really need like a sheet, you know, because otherwise you're flipping through this whole book. However, it's also listed in the book and it goes into some detail about what each move uh, entails. So the move he chose was take away something of theirs. So he had somebody bump into Cadmus, and the guy, he, the guy picked his pocket. He took his, his gun out of its holster, his shoulder holster. And so now Cadmus has lost his gun. Cadmus is a PI. Um, in the, you know, it, actually, Anthony just um, noticed this today. He said, you know, if you, if you actually go and read the description of that move, it says don't take something away from them that, you know, comes to their playbook and the less the fiction really, really, really calls for it. So it's kind of buried there in the text. Although I might argue that maybe the gun didn't come with a playbook. But here's what did come with a playbook. And this is the discussion we were having. Um, Anthony was talking about the idea that he talked to Emergent Play. Go check that channel out. Great channel. Um, years ago, in Emergent Play, this guy was talking about the idea that, that there's, there are times when, you know, in, in play, um, we can do something that damages somebody else's character concept. And Anthony, at the time, was like, I'm not really sure what the hell you're talking about. And, of course, when I hear that, too, I'm thinking, well, special snowflake, okay? Um, don't get insulted. That's just the first thing I was thinking of. But he understood it better now after this particular incident. And so as, as we're talking about it, and nobody's mad that the gun got taken away. That was a great complication. But, you know, the concept of this particular character, the dying, and, 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 and the way Anthony built his character as well, in a narrative sense... You know, because there's, there's not a lot of mechanics to support this empowered by the apocalypse, especially in the veil. We're just going by emotions. But in a narrative sense, his character is a private investigator. His character, his whole business is noticing things and being hyper vigilant. Um, you know, the dying themselves really good at, at noticing patterns and what have you. So we've got this character concept of this really hyper vigilant character, and the idea that you know he could you know even in a sea of people, 
um, be bumped into by you know somebody even if they were professional, and not notice until later that this person had you know reached inside his coat during the winter you know and gotten his gun you know out of its locked shoulder holster, you know it, that didn't line up with the character's concept. The character concept got damaged. That part of the fiction at that point became incongruous. It was not a um, it wasn't something intentional on same old G's part. In fact, I you know I equipped the same old G. I think it might have been in a private message. Like, man, don't feel bad because if it was me, my GM move might have been like having a pipe bomb go off near us, <laughs> you know. And that would be the misfortune that happened because there's a list. You know, what what do you do? What's what's the, what do you you know what kind of GM move are you going to trigger at this point? Um, but we were just talking about that. Interesting because you know this goes back to the idea that you know in in the uh, in the structured gameplay, the rules kind of inform the experience, what is supposed to happen. Um, however, now we have this other narrative point where it's really just up to us to narrate responsibly. You know, it's the holiday season, narrate responsibly, right? And it's, it got me thinking about, you know, how did we handle things like this in the games that I grew up with? So I'm thinking about like basic D&D, you know, first edition D&D, &D, uh, you know, OD&D, &D, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm thinking about that kind of situation for a second. Because every once in a while, we would run into these problems where somebody would say, well, that wouldn't happen to my guy. My guy's too cool. So we're in this crowded city, right? And somebody picks the character's pocket, and, and the player gets upset that this happens. However, if we look at the rules, the rules have, um, in that old game, it has rules for thieves picking pockets. And so if the good guys can do that, you know, the guys in our party can pick pockets, then it stands to reason that, in fact, the bad guys can do it, too. In fact, you know, I think it might have been in the Dungeon Master's Guide to First Edition D&D, &D, that sort of stuff would happen. You might find out that there may be a random encounter in a, in, a, in a city, and it might be that some guy tries to pick your pockets. If they're successful, they've just picked your pockets. There is nothing in the rules that mechanically suggests that your, your character has a chance to be so cool that they'll notice that somebody's picking their pockets. It's all based upon the chan you know, the thief's chances. Now, games got designed differently. Maybe you know, at some point, I'm sure people were upset that, like, hey, you know, I should have some, you know, I have this character concept. If there's nothing in the rules to support it, then there should be. Then I'll make a game. Somebody should. Somebody ought to make a game that supports this. And so I look at my shelf now. Actually, I move my games around, but you look right about over there. I've got a whole bunch of games now where that exists where there are um, attributes such as perception and vigilance, um, et cetera, where people are going to be able to notice when something like that's going to happen. And so there's an opposed role now. It's not just that this, you know, um, I have this character concept, this idea that my character is really hyper vigilant. There's actually rules to support that. Now, what can still happen in these games is you can go in, and I've talked about this a lot on my channel lately, you can go in with this character concept that you cannot support via the rules. You're, you're engaging in character poisoning. You have this concept of a character that, that's cooler than the rule set will actually allow. Either you can't build a character that vigilant, maybe maybe it's your, it's your starting character, just can't be that vigilant, or maybe you just didn't put, you know, you didn't allocate your character build points in the right area. So when you have this uh, concept of your guy, my guy, who who is hyper vigilant, could you know could never have his pockets picked in the busy city because you know he is the most you know he grew up with all the barbarians and blah 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 all the usual crap we invent right, but the game doesn't support it. Interesting. Whereas now we have this uh, you know powered by the apocalypse um, game, this the veil where it's not supported by the mechanics, but it's more up to us to support it by um, the narration and the fiction. You know. And so it, one of the things that got me thinking about is as I was reading Genesis, and you know, which is the engine that powers uh, Fantasy Flight Star Wars, um, you know, I became more and more intrigued in actually, you know, maybe picking up some Star Wars, uh, believe it or not. Um, because, uh, not only was I reading these Genesis books, but I was watching some of Anthony's videos on it, and it got me really, really, you know, uh, more into playing that game. But part of what happens in that particular game, you know, as you look at the, the results that that dice system produces the, the narrative dice system uh, you know we, we go back once again to the structured gameplay and I believe that's actually you know fantasy flight games talks a lot about structured you know play versus and, and narrative play it will produce these results where a lot of times you're succeeding and you're succeeding with some kind of threat and it will it will throw in things occasionally you'll you'll fail but you'll fail sometimes with um, some kind of advantage 
uh, that you might have these moments of incredible triumph, incredible despair. It absolutely screams Star Wars. You know, the the idea that you know you're you you know you're on the Death Star, and you know Obi Wan Kenobi is able to to um, disable the tractor beam, but there's a despair. You know, Darth Vader shows up, and actually you lose Obi Wan Kenobi. He dies. You're able to escape from the Death Star. And it's you know you succeed. However, there's a threat. The Tie Fighters are after you, but you succeed and you get away. But you know. There's there's a threat because or despair because they actually implanted a, a you know a tractor beam on your on your or a targeting uh, thing on your ship so they can find the rebel base you let them right to them and in the end you know there's this triumph as the Millennium Falcon comes in and, and helps Luke Skywalker you know um, get rid of the Tie Fighter so he can blow up the Death Star but there's still a despair or or a threat because Darth Vader gets away and it's, it's that that's the feel of Star Wars that this narrative dice system produces however. Just as important as those dice can and those mechanics cannot produce the Star Wars feel alone, it is incumbent upon the players when they narrate what's happening, what those successes, what those threats, what those triumphs, what those despairs mean. You know how those their characters are doing it. It's up to them to narrate things in such a way that it becomes Star Wars. So it's it's this um, this uh, dualism. The mechanics support this, and the narration supports that. You know they can't do it without each other. And so there's this this point where, as the players, we have to to uh, where it's our job to respond, uh, narrate things in that way, narrate responsibly. And I started thinking though, there's really no difference between that, the agreement to like we are going to create a Star Wars experience, or we're going to create a Musketeers experience, an all for one, or as we're playing the Veil, we're all going to agree to um, you know narrate what we do, you know, as a as a game master or as players in a way that we're going to support the character concepts that are on the table. We're going to support the cyberpunk feel, the feel that we, the three of us, had, had sat down and agreed to come up with. There's no difference between that. There's no difference between um, the group that I'm going to play Uncharted Worlds with, the the uh, the session zero stuff we've had, where we've decided what's the feel of that going to be, and there's no difference between going all the way back to like basic D and D. Um, those ideas are like some of the some of the people that you know originally uh, started the game, and the way we played the game. I don't know if you watched the videos I've had before where I talk about the idea that you know those characters ought to be co competent. There's nothing in the rules that says that like a a third level fighter ought to be able to ride a horse and fix his armor, etc. But that's uh, oftentimes that becomes part of the agreed upon narrative uh, in the game where we just agree that that's part of the trope, that's part of the fiction. And so, once again, the rules support something, or maybe hint at something. Maybe the flavor text in the books hints at something. But it's our job to also narrate that. I find that really, really fascinating. And, you know, so that's, you know, where, you know, my thinking, uh, you know, was... Um, where, where, where that one incident where we were just talking about, like, hey, how, how can we handle that differently, you know, where, where the guy stole my gun and where I even want to put a pipe bomb in there. <laughs> and, you know, how are we going to uh, protect those character concepts because maybe the rules themselves don't do it. And just looking at, like, how, you know, just every game that you can have on your shelf is going to be, have, have this dualism of the rules enforcing a certain amount of play, but at the same point, you know, we as the players have to, you know, come to agreement that we're going to support this genre, this concept, you know, the, the, the feel that we've agreed on, the tone we've agreed on, and the character concepts we have on the table. Sometimes it turns out that those character concepts simply do not fit. You know, it's incongruous with the, with the mechanics. You, you just, you know, try again. You're making the wrong character. Other times, the rules are silent, or they kind of hint at things, and then it's, you know, up to us in or to, to reinforce or protect uh, or create those character concepts and, and the other parts of the genre through narration. Really wild stuff. So what do you think about all that?